Madam Solicitor General, I begin with concern for separation of powers, which is the foundation of the Constitution, and the concerns I have for what the Supreme Court has done, really, in having a consolidation of power. A lot of it going to the court, a lot of it going to the executive branch, and it's all coming from uh, the traditional power of Congress. Uh, before I move into that area, I want to take up a couple of points. Senator Sessions has uh, raised the issue about your being a progressive, a legal progressive. When he was doing that this morning, I was thinking about the Supreme Court's decision yesterday incorporating the Second Amendment into the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, and remember how many objections were raised to the activist liberal Warren Court uh, for doing that. I was a prosecutor at the time, and uh, the law changed, constitutional law changed with uh, 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 Map in Ohio in 61 and Gideon in 63 and Rand in 66, and now we have uh, the five conservatives uh, uh, being uh, progressives or, or activists. Uh, I was uh, intrigued by Senator Hatch's questioning you on the uh, Citizens United case, uh, really uh, uh, an extraordinary case, uh, characterized by what uh, uh, Justice Stevens had to say uh, in dissent. Uh, you have Congress constructing a detailed record, 100,000 pages, and Congress has structured McCain-Feingold based upon the standards set forth by the Supreme Court in uh, Austin versus Michigan Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and then, uh, as Justice Stevens noted, the uh, court pulled the rug out from Congress affirming the constitutionality uh, uh, where it had been in effect uh, for a hundred years, and as Justice Stevens <clears throat> concluded, showing, quote, great disrespect for a co-equal branch. I will try to make my questions as pointed as I can, and to the extent you can answer them briefly, I'd appreciate it. We don't have a whole lot of time. Uh, what is your thinking on uh, disrespect for the Congress when we take a Supreme Court decision and we structure a law based on those standards uh, with the customary deference due uh, Congress on fact-finding. Isn't uh, that really what Justice Stevens calls it, uh, disrespect? Well, Senator Spector, as you know, I argued that case. As you know, um, I filed briefs on behalf of the United States in that case. And in those briefs, the government made a similar kind of argument, that great deference was due to, um, to, to Congress in, its, in the creation of a quite voluminous... Mr. Hagan, I know what you said. You've talked about that a great deal. My question is very pointed. Wasn't that disrespectful? Senator Specter, as I suggested before, when I walked up to that podium in Citizens United, I thought we had extremely strong arguments. Um, uh, I was acting as an advocate, of course, but I, um, uh, I thought we had very okay, strong arguments. I'm going I'm to move on. Uh, I know uh, all of that. Uh, the point that I, I'm trying to find out from you is, what deference you would show to congressional fact-finding. Let me move on. Well, may I, may I try again? Uh, because I think that the answer to that is great deference to congressional fact-finding. Well, was it disrespectful or not? Well, uh, it, again, I don't want to characterize what the Supreme well, Court did. Well, I want did. to move on. If you don't want to characterize, I want to ask my next question. In the uh, uh, U.S. versus Morrison, involving the issue of violence against women. We had a 
mountain of evidence assembled, as Justice Stewart, Souter pointed out in dissent, and uh, the court uh, rejected congressional findings because of our, quote, method of reasoning. Uh, you haven't crossed the street to the Supreme Court yet, but do you think that there is some unique endowment when nominees leave this room and walk across the street to have a method of reasoning which is superior to congressional method of reasoning so that we can, the court can disregard voluminous records uh, because of our method of reasoning? But to the contrary, Senator Specter, I think it's extremely important for judges to realize that there is a kind of uh, uh, reasoning and a kind of development of factual material, more particularly, that goes on in Congress. Then you that, disagree with Chief Justice Rehnquist? I, I think that it's, uh, that it's very important for the courts to uh, defer to congressional fact-finding, understanding that the courts have no ability to do fact-finding, are not uh, would not legitimately, could not what, legitimately what, uh, do fact-finding? Well, I know all of that, but what do you think of our method of reasoning? As I, as I said earlier, Senator Specter, I have enormous respect for the legislative process, and part of that respect comes from um, working in the White House and, and, and working with Congress on a great many uh, pieces of legislation. I'm going to move on to my next question. Justice uh, Scalia in uh, Lane uh, attacked the standard of congruence and proportionality, saying that uh, this court is acting as Congress's taskmaster. Uh, the court is t checking on congressional homework to make sure that it has identified sufficient constitutional violations to make its remedy constitutional and proportional. Uh, I picked out three uh, instances, uh, Citizens United, where uh, uh, Justice Stevens says great disrespect and the attack by Rehnquist on our method of reasoning, and Scalia talking about uh, uh, proportionality and congruence. And that brings me to uh, the question for you uh, where you have uh, been very explicit in the now famous uh, University of Chicago uh, Law Review article about dealing with substantive issues. We had the standard for determining constitutionality under the Commerce Clause from Maryland versus Wirtz. 1968, Justice Harlan, who established that standard, quote, where we find that the legislators have a rational basis for finding a chosen regulatory scheme necessary to the protection of commerce, our investigation is at an end. In the city of Bernie case, 1997, the court pulled out of thin air a new test, and the test is whether the uh, legislation uh, is uh, proportionate uh, and congruent. And uh, that is the test which Justice Scalia so roundly criticized, saying it was flabby and it was an excuse for a judicial legislation. Now, would you uh, take uh, Harlan's test as opposed to the congruence and uh, proportionality test? Senator Specter, Justice Scalia is not the only person who has been critical of the test. Uh, uh, a number of people have noted that the test, uh, which is, of course, a, 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 a test relating to Congress's power to legislate under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, that the test has led to uh, some apparently inconsistent results in different cases. So you have a, a case like uh, Garrett on the one hand and a case like Tennessee versus Lane on the other. I know those cases very well. Uh, five to four, uh, O'Connor went the other way, uh, but they both used proportionate uh, and congruent. 
Uh, what I want to know from you is whether you think that is an appropriate standard to replace the rational basis test of words. Well, it is the standard of the court right now. It is precedent, and it is uh, 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 entitled to wait as precedent. Now, as, as you very well um, know, Senator Spector, there are times when the court decides that precedent is unworkable. Um, because it just it, it produces a set of chaotic results. What was unworkable about the Wirtz test for a reasonable basis contrasted with uh, congruent and proportional, which nobody understands? Yes, no, I wasn't, I wasn't suggesting that the Wirtz test was unworkable. I think that the, the question going forward, and it is a question, I'm not um, stating any conclusion on it, but I think that um, something that Justice Scalia and others are thinking about is whether the congruent and proportionality test is workable or whether it produces such chaotic results and gives so little... Do you think it is workable? Senator Spector, I've, I've not really delved into the question in the way I would want to as a judge, reading all the briefs, listening to the arguments, thinking through the issues from both sides. But I do know that the court needs, excuse me, that Congress needs very clear guidance in this area. It's not fair to Congress to keep on moving the goalposts. It's not fair to say, oh, well, you know, if you do this this time, it will be okay, but if you do that the next time, it won't. So uh, I do Bacon, think this is an issue we discussed weeks ago. This is an issue I raised in a series of letters, which I'll put into the record. Uh, uh, this is a standard which has been around uh, for a long time, and uh, you know a lot of law. Senator Grassley established that. Uh, is it a satisfactory test? Well, let me move on to another question. I don't think I'm making too much progress. One of the grave concerns which has arisen out of the out of recent confirmation proceedings with uh, Chief Justice uh, Roberts and Justice Alito, and I've spoken about this subject extensively on the floor, citing how emphatic uh, Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Alito were on deferring to Congress. It's a legislative function. It's not a judicial function, they say. If you engage in fact-finding, if the court does that, the court is transgressing into the congressional uh, area. And then you have a case like Citizens United uh, and others, and you have the declarations by the Chief Justice of modesty. You've adopted that standard. Uh, his more emphatic standard was not to jolt the system. Uh, is there any way you could look at Citizens United other than it's being a tremendous jolt to the system? Well, Senator Inspector, uh, again, this is one that as an advocate I've taken a, a strong view on, which is that it was a jolt to the system, that um, there, were, there was a great deal of reliance interests involved, that many states had passed pieces of legislation uh, in reliance upon Austin, that Congress had passed legislation after accumulating a voluminous record. Ms. Kagan, you have said that many times today about your advocacy in the case. But what I want to know is, as a prospective justice, do you consider it a jolt to the system? Senator Spector, it's a little bit difficult to take uh, off the advocate's hat and put on the judge's hat. And one of the things that I think uh, is, is important is that I appreciate the difference between the two. And I have been an advocate with respect to Citizens United, and that's the way I came to the case, the way I approached the case. I hope that I did um, a good and effective job in it. Um, and, and I believed what I was saying, but it's a different role and it's a different thought process than the role and the thought process that one would uh, use as a judge. Well, uh, what I'm interested in is uh, what you use as a judge, but let me, uh, let me move on again. Uh, there's a lot of concern in the Senate about uh, the value of these hearings. Uh, when we have the kinds of declarations at that table your predecessor nominees on deference to Congress, and then there's none given. Not to jolt the system and be modest, and there's a 
180 degree U-turn. And we wonder what we can uh, do about it. Uh, judicial independence is the bulwark of this republic. Judicial independence gives us the rule of law, and it is our most highly prized value. And while the Congress and the executive branch fumbled on segregation for decades, really centuries, the court came along and uh, acted uh, on the subject uh, in a progressive way, a very progressive way, in a very activistic way. Nobody challenges it uh, on either side of the aisle today. So we really have the highest respect for judicial independence. But what do we do when we confirm nominees and uh, they don't follow through on very flat commitments? Uh, but this is not just my view. Uh, the view of Richard Posner is very, uh, very tough in his book, uh, How Judges Think. And this is what he has to say about the subject I'm addressing, quote, Less than two years after his confirmation, referring to Chief Justice Roberts, he demonstrated by his judicial votes and opinions that he aspires to make changes in significant areas of constitutional law. The tension between what he said at his confirmation hearing and what he is doing as a justice is a blow to Roberts' reputation for candor and further displacement of the already debased currency of the testimony of nominees at judicial confirmation hearings, close quote. Now, we're trying to raise the level of that currency. Uh, uh, I don't believe you want to make a comment about that, but if you do, you're welcome to. Senator Spetcher, I, I assume the good faith of everybody who sits in this chair. And um, uh, I, 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 there's no reason in my mind to think otherwise. Um, uh, Madam Solicitor General, I agree with you as to good faith. And raising these issues in a series of speeches on the floor, I have explicitly said that I'm not challenging the good faith of Chief Justice Roberts or Justice Alito. And I understand the difference between sitting at that witness plot and uh, deciding a case in controversy that comes before the court. Uh, but that still leaves us with a problem. Uh, the best answer that uh, uh, a group of senators, uh, we talk about this with some frequency, can come up with is to uh, put some sunlight on the court. Uh, as I said in my opening statement, the disinfectant that Brandeis talked about, sunlight, the best disinfectant. Well, it's not quite a disinfectant. But I think if uh, the public understood what was happening, there would be a strong temptation to stand by what had been said in these confirmation hearings. But I was really glad to hear you say in response to Senator Cole's questions that you favor televising the Supreme Court. Uh, I think we uh, may be getting closer. Uh, I've been at it for more than a decade with a whole series of bills. And uh, recently, the Judiciary Committee voted out a bill uh, to televise the Supreme Court 13 to 6. And we did it a couple of years ago, 12 to uh, 6. And um, I know it's going to be something the court's going to have to uh, come to, uh, perhaps on its own. Uh, but uh, uh, the uh, public views are uh, uh, increasing. Uh, a poll which was released by uh, C-SPAN just uh, yesterday shows that 63 percent of the American people favor televising the court. And among the 37 percent who opposed, when they were told that people can only be in the Supreme Court uh, chamber for about three minutes, accommodates only a couple hundred people, 60% uh, of those, 37%, thought the court should be televised, which brings the total to about 85%. Uh, I know we don't run the court by public opinion polls, but 
isn't that fairly weighty as to what the, the American people would like to like to know? We talked about uh, a living Constitution and about the Constitution expressing the changing values of our society, as Cardoza said so eloquently in Palco. If the people of this country knew that uh, the court was deciding all of the cutting-edge questions, a woman's right to choose who lives, death penalty cases for juvenile, who dies, affirmative action, who gets into college, freedom of speech and religion. Uh, the American people responded in a poll to Citizens United, 85 percent thought it was a terrible decision. Ninety-five percent thought that corporations made contributions to influence legislators. One of the great problems of uh, uh, the skepticism of the American people about Congress, and is it heavy out there? It's uh, open season on Congress because of uh, uh, so much of what uh, people think about. Well, coming back to the court, wouldn't it be, uh, uh, well, you've already said you're in favor of uh, televising the court, but uh, uh, wouldn't televising the court and information as to what the court does uh, have uh, an impact on the values which uh, are reflected in the American people? I, I do think, Senator Specter, it would be a good thing from many perspectives, and I would uh, hope to if I'm fortunate enough to be confirmed to engage with the other Supreme Court justices about that question. I think uh, it's, it's always a good thing when people understand more about government rather than less. And um, uh, I, certainly the Supreme Court is an important institution and one that the American citizenry has every right to, to, to know about and understand. And I also think that um, uh, it would be a, 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 a good thing for the court itself that – uh, that greater understanding of the court, I think, would redound to its own advantage. So I think from all perspectives, um, uh, televising would be a, a good idea. Now, I recognize that some people, some justices may have views to the contrary, and I would want to uh, hear those views and to think about those views. But, 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 but that's sort of my going in thought. Which, uh, I will put into the record what uh, the justices have had to say. I've questioned almost everybody about this subject, and I've had the opportunity to question all of the people on the court now. Uh, but there's a lot, uh, there are a lot of those who uh, have, have been favorably disposed to, or at least have acknowledged its inevitability, and remind them that they all appeared on television this year on C-SPAN, and that most of them, have, many of them have appeared uh, over the years, uh, selling books and being uh, in a variety of, uh, of situations. It means I'd have to get my hair done more often, Senator Specter. Uh, uh, let, let me commend you on. <laughs> let me commend you on that last comment, uh, and I say that seriously. You have shown a really uh, admirable sense of humor, and uh, I think that is really uh, important. And as uh, Senator Schumer said uh, yesterday. Uh, we're looking for somebody who can moderate the court. And a little humor would do them a lot of good. Uh, in the case of Richmond Newspapers versus Virginia, uh, the Supreme Court said in, uh, that a public trial belongs not only to the accused, but to the public and press as well. People now acquire information on court procedures chiefly through the print and electronic media. That's a 1980 decision which upheld the uh, newspaper's rights to be in court and uh, observe a trial. Uh, isn't that some pretty solid precedent uh, uh, to say uh, uh, that as a legal as a matter of law, the court uh, uh, ought to have television to have public access, because that's the way most people get their information these days? That, that's very interesting, Senator Specter. I had never considered the relevance of that case to the, 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 the televising question, but I think that the, certainly the, the principles in that case, the values in that case, are about um, uh, the, the, the public's ability to know how our governmental institutions work, which is what's critical to this issue as well. Let me move on to... Uh, 
uh, another subject which I consider to be of uh, uh, great importance, and that is the uh, agenda of the court, the number of cases the court hears. Uh, in 1886, uh, the court decided 451 cases. In uh, 1987, a little more than 20 years ago, 146 uh, cases. Uh, in 2006, uh, 67. 2007, 75. Uh, 2008, well, 2006, 68. 2007, 67. 2008, 75. 2009, finishing yesterday, uh, 73. Court leaves a lot of circuit splits uh, uh, unresolved. Uh, the court uh, does not hear uh, a great many critical cases. And I discussed this with you in our meeting several weeks ago and wrote you about it as well, and that is the uh, case involving the uh, terrorist surveillance program uh, and the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which arguably poses the sharpest conflict between uh, uh, the Congress legislating FISA and the president asserting Article II powers. The federal court in uh, uh, Detroit found the terrorist surveillance program unconstitutional. The Sixth Circuit ducked it two to one with a very strong dissent on standing grounds, which is traditionally a way of avoiding a case, and the Supreme Court denied cert. Uh, Congress has the authority to uh, tell the court what cases to take. We've legislated giving you discretionary authority, but in cases, uh, many cases, illustratively, the flag burning case and uh, McCain Feingold and uh, Federal Labor Standards Act, we directed the court to, to hear the case. So I think it's fair to ask if uh, what you would have done, at, not how you would decide that case, but whether you would, would take the case. Uh, had you been on the Supreme Court, would you have voted to grant cert in the terrorist surveillance program case? Senator Inspector, if, if I might, and just to your first point, which was the uh, point about the court's declining docket, I do generally agree with that. I clerked on the court in, in 1987, which was pretty much at the high point of, of what the court was, um, was doing, about 140 cases a year. And it is a, a bit of a mystery why it's declined so precipitously. Um, and, and I do agree with you that um, uh, there, there do seem to be many circuit conflicts and other matters of uh, vital national significance. The other issue I raised was much more important. Okay. And there are only two minutes left for okay. me now. Um, uh, Senator, Senator Spector, the, the, the issue about the TSP and the constitutionality of the TSP is, I think, one of the kinds of issues I, 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 I previously set out three categories where the court uh, might grant cert, one which is circuit conflicts, one which is the invalidation of an act of Congress, and the third is um, uh, uh, just an uh, issue of, of, of some vital national importance. And a, and a case where the executive branch is determined uh, or is, is alleged, excuse me, is alleged uh, to be violating some congressional uh, command is, I think, one of the kinds of cases that the court typically should take. Now, there is in this case the uh, complexity that there is a potential jurisdictional bar. And, of course, the court typically um, uh, decides... What, what jurisdictional bar? Well, the question whether somebody has standing. So uh, often the court will decline to take a case when there's a significant jurisdictional issue because the court will think, well, if we take this case, we might hold that we don't have jurisdiction and well, we'll never... They can take the case and say they don't have jurisdiction. Yes, you're, you're exactly right. And, and uh, I'm just um, suggesting that that's often a reason why the court doesn't take a case. If it doesn't I don't know, care what's often a reason. Here we have a specific case. You've had a lot of notice. It's in concrete. Would you have voted the grant cert? Senator Spector, I can, I can just tell you there was this jurisdictional issue. Now, the jurisdictional issue itself was an important one. It was an important one because um, 
how, how is a person going to know uh, whether the Sixth person has Circuit been surveilled? Sixth Circuit decided there was no standing after they heard the case. Well, my time is almost up uh, 10 seconds, and I was 13 seconds over last time. There are a couple of other cases, the Holocaust survivors and the 9-11 survivors of victims, which uh, I'll come back to when I have a green light. Thank you very much, Senator Specter and, and Senator Graham.